This documentary examines the varied experiences of contemporary pilgrims in their own words. At the same time, it locates travelers within a broader context of historical events, traditional rituals, and sacred spaces that often both shape and orient these pilgrims' experiences. For those who are considering the pilgrimage themselves, this film is designed to give an overview of what they might encounter and how they might prepare for the journey. Astorgas is the next city of historical interest. It has ancient roots in Celtic and pre-Celtic tribes and became an important Roman city beginning in 14 before the Common Era. After a period of decline during the Reconquista, it was resurrected in the 11th century as a major resting place for pilgrims before their ascent to the higher elevations in the mountainous landscapes of Galicia. The city retains its original Roman walls. The first site of importance is the Episcopal Palace, designed by the renowned Spanish architect Antoni Gaudi in 1889 following a fire in the original structure. The neo-medieval style, which replicates other historic buildings in the town, is built from gray granite. It features elements unique to Gaudi, such as chimneys integrated into the side facades and a main facade with four cylindrical towers. The palace currently serves as a museum of religious art related to the Camino. Another architectural and artistic treasure is the Cathedral of Santa Maria, a Gothic structure built on Romanesque foundations. The Diocese of Astorga dates to at least the third century and has the title of Apostolic because of traditions that both St. James and St. Paul preached here. Because its construction continued into the 18th century, the cathedral has added a Baroque facade and a Renaissance portico. The interior features such artworks as the ornate Spanish Renaissance high altar with its icon of St. James, a Flemish Spanish retablo of St. Michael, and a sculpture known as Purissima from 1626 depicting the woman clothed with the sun the Immaculate Conception. There is also this well-preserved Renaissance clock with its solar and lunar symbols. Ponferrada, the last major city on the Camino before Santiago itself, has roots in the Roman era when the area's mining trade provided gold and other minerals to the expanding empire. Ferdinand II of Leon donated the town to the Knights Templars in 1178 and they used the fortress as a sanctuary for Camino pilgrims. Historians believe this castle served as the headquarters for the Grand Master of Castile until it was confiscated following the dissolution of the Templars in 1312. It is one of the few intact Templar castles left in Europe. There is a town tradition claiming that the last Templar Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, visited the castle during his own pilgrimage to Santiago and that he left his iconic sword in the chapel when he departed. Some local townspeople maintain that it remained hidden here until the Franco era, when it disappeared, perhaps taken by Franco himself to buttress his own mystique as the defender of Catholicism. Another tradition alleges that a network of underground tunnels connected the castle with two other castles in the area and provided a hidden sanctuary for the Templars during times of attack. The castle eventually became the property of the King of Spain and today is undergoing extensive restoration. Pilgrims can visit the Templar Library and Research Center housed inside. Those with an interest in this mysterious order and its modern tributary organizations will find Templar echoes throughout the French Way. Pilgrims now enter the stunning landscapes of Galicia, Spain's remote northwest corner. The province has a unique culture and language with echoes of Celtic and Visigothic times. A popular stop is the hamlet of Osibrero, located on a pass at 1,300 meters with breathtaking views of the surrounding area.
The town's narrow cobbled streets are flanked by hostels, shops, and restaurants, providing welcome services in this often windswept and rainy portion of the Camino. The hamlet's Pelosas are traditional mountain dwellings of Celtic origin, found only in this region of Galicia. The structures are circular, with walls of granite or slate, topped by thatched roofs. Nine Pelosas have been preserved, with one serving as an ethnological museum. The restored church of Santa Maria la Real, whose foundations date to 836, welcomes pilgrims for quiet devotions and nightly mass. In a side chapel is this memorial to Elias San Pedro, the village priest in the late 20th century. He was a key figure in the revival of the Camino, principally by painting yellow arrows along the French Way in the 1970s and 1980s. The chapel also houses this shrine donated by Queen Isabella to commemorate the Eucharistic miracle that occurred here during the cold winter of 1300. During a fierce snowstorm, only one local farmer came to communion. The village priest, who had lost his faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, reluctantly offered Mass, secretly despising the farmer's faith. As he pronounced the words of consecration, the host changed into the real flesh of Christ and the wine the real blood. The blood overflowed the chalice and stained the altar cloth. It is the blood-stained altar cloth and the chalice that are kept in this crystal shrine and remain a focus of pilgrim devotion. The Camino descends from this high pass and provides vistas of lush forests and hillsides as far as the eye can see. Pilgrims have time to reflect on what the Camino has taught them thus far. You know, I really thought that there would be something as far as a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And as the days go by, I've been coming to the realization that it's not only you know, there's a spiritual component to the Camino, and that's very important. And for different people, I think it's a different, a different experience spiritually. But there's also like a, one of the big things I've gotten out of it is just truly uh, savoring each moment and little things in life that we take for granted, like whether it be washing socks in the, in the sink or eating a really delicious orange or looking at the beauty of nature. Uh, so that, just the, the being present mm -hmm. in the moment is uh, something I've gotten out of this. And I've thought about that before, but the Camino really brings it home. The, the camaraderie of meeting people on the uh, path is also a wonderful component of realizing that we're all from all over the world and everybody's getting along and helping one another, whether it be that guy Camino John or the fellas I met from China and Korea who were so nice to me and you know it just it's a, really been a, a great experience but not what I had expected. What had you expected? I think I, I'm not really sure but I think it was going to be a lot more of a prayerful you know, like an epiphany and the epiphany is just the process of walking. <laughs> Epiphany, there's no great epiphanies. Maybe people have them, I'm not. But it's just really feeling blessed that God gives me each day to walk on the earth. In time, the Royal Benedictine Abbey of St. Julian of Samos emerges into view. The present complex began as a community of hermits in the sixth century. Over time, it gained royal patronage and protection and became a sanctuary for pilgrims. After the expulsion of the remaining monks in 1835, 12 monks returned in 1880, and their brethren have been a continuous presence ever since. The monks are busy as artisans, librarians, publishers, and gardeners. After its near destruction by fire in 1951, the monastery was rebuilt and presently offers hostel services, pilgrim masses, and tours of the church and cloisters. A stroll through the picturesque town offers these views of the Surya River, various examples of the scallop shell that symbolizes the Santiago pilgrimage, 
and this ancient stone church in a nearby park. This statue of a traditional peregrino points the way as pilgrims leave Samos for their next destination, Saria. Saria is where many pilgrims begin their walk as it marks the minimum distance needed to earn the Compostela, the indulgence granted in Santiago. Here the landscape changes to rolling hills, lush farmlands, and shaded streams. Pilgrims encounter a greater flow of fellow travelers, especially during the peak summer months. So did you all have any uh, specific in individual intentions for doing the Camino? Well, I've known about it for about 15 years. I always wanted to do it, and the opportunity never came up. But I finally did, it was the right time. Everything fell into place, and everything couldn't have been more perfect the way it worked out. And I didn't do it for religious reasons at all. I just did it because it seemed like the right thing to do. I meet a lot of interesting people, and everyone has been very kind. Everything has worked out. Like they say, the Camino will um, provide. I get emotional. My reason was she got me into it <clears throat> a few years back. <clears throat> yeah. And we started seeing documentaries, movies, the movie The Way. I got into it then, but my reason for it was I like the camaraderie, the brotherhood. And I, as I talk to people and all over, uh, all over the world, and they're all, we have, the, we share this common goal, this common uh, sense of what we're doing. And it really is, uh, it's hard to describe until you feel it. It's um, amazing, and that, that's what I'm getting out of it, and that's why I'm here. I just want to say that I've known him for 36 years, and walking the Camino, we have learned stuff about each other that, I mean, we're talkers, we talk all the time. We know each other inside out, and we have learned stuff on the Camino, uh, and we have been enlightened about each other. It's Amen. Been, it's been the next major resting stop is Porto Marin, the site of a second century Roman bridge that used to span the Minho River. What remains at the end of the new bridge is the base and one of its arches, which pilgrims climb for a better view. In 1962, the town was moved to this hilltop following the construction of a reservoir that flooded the ancient town site. The city center preserves some old slate houses and traditional wine cellars, a common place in this wine-growing region. The most important civil and religious buildings were reconstructed stone by stone. They include the Romanesque Church of St. John, originally built by the Knights of St. John in the 12th century. The Knights of St. John protected pilgrims on the road to Jerusalem during the Crusades and provided lodging and medical assistance throughout Europe. Medieval Gregorian chants can still be heard at Vespers in this fortress-like sanctuary. The trail out of Porta Marin climbs up to a plateau and passes by this Roman era settlement with characteristic rectangular and square buildings surrounded by a defensive wall. The site is in well-preserved condition and provides a good resting place after the demanding morning climb. It is in this section of the Camino that one starts to see these small memorials to pilgrims who died before reaching Santiago. They are a reminder that the journey can be physically demanding and that, although much safer than in past eras, the Camino poses both psychological and physical risks. The next stop is the town of Palas de Rey, whose history goes back to Visigothic times. 
the Codex Calixtinus considered the town an obligatory stop on the Camino, and its churches referenced the Galician Romanesque style. The Church of Palasta Rey holds pilgrims masses every day that are well attended by the many peregrinos passing through the town. The masses are attended by Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Do you see this pilgrimage as good for the church? Oh, absolutely. I've no doubt the, the Holy Spirit is moving on the Camino. Because you see what happens, it brings out the very best in people. Mm -hmm. You're there and you're, you're, <laughs> you're sort of in a room with a hundred other people, you know, unwashed and sort of, you know, shuffling and all. But we share a common bond because we're pilgrims. And it's sort of the church, you know, it's like Pope Francis says, like, you know, we're, we're sort of, the, the church is um, a field hospital of kind of people who are kind of working their way along, they're doing okay, but sometimes stuff happens, and we've got to be open and accepting of everybody, including ourselves. I, each year I organize a group and I bring on the Camino, and I kind of open it out to, to anybody really, kind of young adults. I suppose the idea is I've been doing the Camino now for about 15 years, so each year I come over and I do a bit of the Camino, and this is kind of part of the program of giving something back, because the experience is... It's wonderful, you know, you meet the most interesting of people, uh, it's a reflective experience, you're seeing a beautiful part of the world, you're walking with people who are exploring questions of all ways, shapes and forms, and it's a real, it's a sacred space. And a lot of people, I suppose the group I take will all be first timers, so the idea is, if you've never done a walking pilgrimage before, it can be quite, maybe quite intimidating. So it's helpful to have someone just to kind of point the way. I don't do that much. I let them kind of do most of it themselves. Yeah. And they discover themselves and they kind of discover, like they were saying at dinner this evening, they were amazed that they were able to do so much over the last few days that they wouldn't have thought possible. So, you know, walking, I think so far, they've, they've just done like 50 something kilometers, which is really quite short, but they're really excited about it. Yeah. And then the hope will be, and it, it's happened quite a bit, that those who do the first week will go back and begin the Camino in saint Jean, or even more importantly, they'll take what they've learned from the Camino and bring it home with them, and it changes their lives. In this last section of the Camino, it is not uncommon to see whole families walking the way, sometimes with infants and toddlers. For other pilgrims, the children in their lives are part of their intention for walking the way. And then someone mentioned this, that we've been doing the water, why don't you do it for a charity event as well? Miles. So I said to Steve, um, what about cancer? And he says, no, 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 I don't want to do it for cancer. He says, but I'll do it for your grandson, because my grandson's autistic, five years old and he doesn't speak. And you see... So, from there raising funds, getting his first tricycle, which will help him with his uh, coordination and to enjoy life with his brother. Yeah. I, I, I keep these beads with me that I bought and my, my mother took him to uh, the hospice and she got the priest there to um, bless him. So every day, give him a kiss and hope that one day my grandson will talk because you have to keep repeating over and over and over again for him to say words. And he does say them, but the brain doesn't register it. So you have to keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. So he's five years old now and he's non-verbal. So just hope that one day he'll speak. The Camino also provides opportunities for creative expression in the arts and music. Ancient historians have found links between Galician coastal settlements and Ireland that go back to Neolithic times. Many pilgrims say Galician culture reminds them of the Celtic culture of Ireland. As pilgrims move through the small hamlets of Galicia, they see these distinctive looking cribs along the roadside. They are a traditional way of protecting roosting hens from hungry foxes and for protecting grain stores from the dampness of the ground. The Camino 
introduces you to an authentic way to travel. I, I ran across this multiple times um, from multiple people who were doing the pilgrimage for non-religious reasons, um, who, were, who were seeking adventure and authentic culture. And when you take the time to walk from small town to small town, eating, eating the local cuisine, talking with locals as well as fellow travelers, you really get the sense of authenticity when it comes to your travel experiences. For example, the mileage I walked um, for over the course of a month and a week, um, I could have driven in eight hours. I and seeing taking that time, um, just that time disparity really makes me evaluate how I travel now and all, what am I what am I missing during those like long hours on the interstate. In rural Galicia, the Camino often crosses medieval bridges like this one over the Ferelos River. It leads to the Romanesque Church of St. John, which features this impressive neoclassical and Rococo altarpiece and this unusual neo-Gothic carving of Christ on the cross. The figure's right arm hangs free in a gesture of mercy and concern for humanity. Pilgrims next enter the 10th century town of Melide, where the French Way and the Primitive Way, which follows the north coast of Spain, meet. The town features the 12th century Church of Santa Maria and restaurants that are famous for their boiled octopus, a regional delicacy. After the long walk from Palas de Rey, these pulperias are a welcome stop for lunch. Seafood like octopus and scallops, various cheeses, and every possible preparation of ham are some of the many specialties peregrinos can enjoy as part of their journey. Tables are always full at the best known of the pulperias, providing opportunities to meet new friends and old. There are a variety of cafes, bars, and pop-up refreshment stands along this final segment of the Camino. After a walk through more Galician villages, peregrinos come to this medieval bridge that leads to the hamlet of Ribadiso. A hostel for pilgrims has been here since the 15th century and is now maintained by the Galician government. The hostel and nearby stream are a favored resting spot for tired feet. This section of the Camino was one of the last rural districts before pilgrims reached the outskirts of Santiago. The Fellowship of the Way is in full bloom. My grandma died a few years ago and it was right after I graduated from med school. And my mom wasn't there for the graduation, she wasn't there for my grandma's passing a month later either. And so it's kind of been weighing on her conscience and she's wanted to do this and she's done a few in Canada but they're really short. And so it's kind of been playing around on her mind and there's no way in hell I'd let her do it on her own because her Spanish is non-existent and her sense of direction even more so. But it's, it's been good and I lived so, with my grandma for six years so it was, okay. it's kind of like homage to her. And uh, your mother, what, what's her intention? Just to pray and to feel like she's with my grandma. Uh -huh. She says that they used to travel a lot when they were young and so they would do all sorts of pilgrimages and things like that together so this is kind of like having her with her here. Everyone is so friendly and everyone helps you out and you sit down, you make all sorts of friends no matter where you go. Um, we had one girl actually. Oh, I'm so gracia this morning, managed to get bit by a dog. And the two other guys that we were with visited her in the hospital make sure she was okay. By the next day, Santiago emerges into view, and many pilgrims stop at the famous Mountain of Joy. The Codex Calixtinus recounts a miracle from 1080, when 20 French knights began their pilgrimage with an oath to protect each other. One knight became sick in the Pyrenees, and was left behind except by one faithful companion. The legend claims that the Apostle Santiago miraculously transported the two knights on horseback to the Mount of Joy to teach their disloyal companions the true meaning of the Camino. Pope John Paul II celebrated the World Youth Meeting here in 1989 
an event that helped promote the Camino's resurgence since that time. During the whole year of 1993, the vista was marked by two sculptures of pilgrims and a controversial installation of ceramic, steel, and stone. The mount provides pilgrims with a moment for reflection on their journey's meaning. Did you personally have any kind of religious or spiritual intention in walking the Camino? I did. I was hoping to grow closer in encountering God and also people um, and also myself I think along the way so in that way I was hoping to learn more about each one of those aspects and I think in a way um, process through some things and learn how to forgive some aspects or people in my life. Yeah. And has that process uh, unfolded for you? Um, I think so, but in a slower way than I would want it to. Okay. Um, I was expecting to come in like and be transformed like fully, but I think I'm learning to be grateful for the small increments of yeah. change. And what, what have been the most vivid impressions uh, that you've experienced so far? Mm -hmm. Of the Camino? I think the community that is formed on it um, between the people who start in France and the other areas, just how people look out for one another and encourage one another along the way has been very, very transformative. Hi, I'm Saba. I'm from San Francisco, California. I am May. Same, I'm her mother. We are both in education. I'm therapist and teach also and uh, often travel. This is our first time in El Camino. It is an amazing experience. I am not Christian. I am born in a Muslim family. The intention is not to practice the religion. The intention for me is to find, uh, to be a better person. You know, there's always room to improve in that aspect. So I'm finding that and this has been an amazing experience to walk, feel pain, but then get a chance to think and find a peace, a point of peace for yourself. The best is just like uh, after some point that you think I cannot do it, you just like forget about it and you believe and you find in your brain and your heart, you can do it. I mean, God is everywhere. And I, we are in this, involved in this prayer every day, which I love it. And it says that it's, a, it's I'm by you, I'm holding your hand, just go. In past eras, some pilgrims would walk the final five kilometers into Santiago barefoot as a gesture of devotion and gratitude. Today's pilgrims quicken their pace, whether on bicycle or foot, and enter the city with mounting anticipation. And I also met a group of Portuguese men who were walking with the Portuguese way that happened to intersect with the French way at one point. And they were all so excited because they were getting closer and closer to Santiago, so we were all cheering and counting down the kilometers, it's just a, almost like a festive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Just the closer you get to Santiago, you hear people singing around you. I even saw some people dancing before they got too tired from doing that. This plaque on the outskirts of the city depicts the story of how Santiago's relics were miraculously brought to Galicia after his martyrdom in Jerusalem in 44 of the Common Era. The tradition claims that St. James' body was miraculously transported to northwest Spain by ship and later to present-day Compostela. Whether religious believers or not, modern-day pilgrims pour into the city and move toward the great cathedral where the relics of St. James are on display. The papal blessing of the pilgrimage and the church's granting of indulgences for past sins is reinforced at installations like this one on the outskirts of the town. In Catholic teaching, an indulgence can be granted by the Pope to reduce the time a soul must spend in purgatory after physical death. This church has a vivid tableau reminding penitents of the fires of purgatory that await them without such an indulgence. As pilgrims come closer to the cathedral, they encounter beautiful gardens, elegant buildings, and public squares. As they pour into Obradoro Square, in front of the western facade of the cathedral, pilgrims are filled with a spirit of celebration, 
gratitude, and sometimes plain relief that the physical ordeal of the journey is at an end. From every vantage point, statues of St. James hover over pilgrims, reminding the faithful of his protection and blessing. Fellow travelers stop to embrace and acknowledge the friendship and support they have received during the journey. It is not difficult to find pilgrims who are willing to share their stories. Uh, I walked uh, here to uh, Santiago from uh, St. John, and we started on the 11th of May, and we only arrived here today, June 14th. Uh, for me, I, I think of it as a, a spiritual journey in the sense that my great-grandparents immigrated from Bolivia, and I traveled back to Cuba in uh, September of uh, 15, and now I'm kind of making this uh, circular uh, visit. You know, I, I was born and raised in Cuba. My great-grandparents were born and raised in Galicia, and I'm back here, and I've traveled with uh, two other friends from the United States. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. I've met wonderful people, had wonderful experiences. There's a special closeness that one develops. And um, you learn people's personal stories, the histories, the trials and tribulations that they've uh, suffered through life. And great stories, some sad, some great. But uh, it's been a wonderful trip, and I'm really grateful that I've, I am here. But I think in the end, what wins people over is a community that formed, especially for people who started all the way in the Pyrenees and walked the entire French way or walk the entire Portuguese way. There's this bond that shows up and you, you see a lot of the same people every single day. Even the few short days that I had been walking, the last 110 kilometers, I was writing people that I knew, we'd shout when we saw each other, people would come up and help me if I ever needed anything. It was the most generous and instant community that I've ever been in. It, it formed without any second thought. People just pour their hearts out to you on the Camino. Like I said, instant community, people just, there's no walls that are put. I found myself telling people some of my deepest thoughts, and we would have this dialogue where there was no judgment, no second guesses, just openness and a willingness to help each other, provide insight, wonder with the other person. The commercial aspects of the pilgrimage are on full display in Santiago, whether it is the miniature train rides, Galician musicians hawking their music CDs, or the souvenir shops that dominate the surrounding neighborhoods. After the initial celebrations, pilgrims find their way to hostels or well-deserved luxury hotels so that they can shower, rest, and prepare for their experience of the cathedral itself. The luxurious Parador de Santiago, which sits on Obradoro Square, was built as a royal hospital in 1499 to accommodate pilgrims. Inside are stately cloisters, elegant guest rooms, and a dining room that offers local seafood cuisine. A visit to the Romanesque Cathedral of Santiago usually includes three traditional rites. The first is to touch the famous column in the west-facing Portal of Glory. The column is a sculpture of St. James above the kneeling figure of Master Matteo, the portal's architect. Pilgrims used to rub their heads against this figure to receive wisdom, but in recent years, access to the column has been prohibited to preserve it from damage. Because of recent extensive renovations of the Portal of Glory, most pilgrims will enter the cathedral for the first time through the Plaza de Platalias, or South Gate. This entrance is the modern cathedral's only remaining 11th century Romanesque facade and features two portals with archivolts and tympanums comprised of figures depicting the temptation and passion of Christ. Above the archivolts are figures of apostles and prophets. Once inside, Pilgrims can enter the central nave and view the high altar with its gilded statues of St. James, angels, white horses, and various columns and decorations. 
The pilgrim's second task is to climb a stairway behind the main St. James figure and embrace the figure's cape from behind, usually with a prayer request and an expression of gratitude for a safe Camino. The polychromatic stone sculpture dates from the 13th century. The pilgrim's third traditional task is to take this stairway into a small room below the altar, where they can venerate a silver reliquary with the remains of St. James. This is a time for silent prayer and for special requests that can be written and slipped through the metal gates in front of the reliquary. Modern historians question the authenticity of this sacred relic. But according to documentable church tradition, the relics of St. James were first brought to the church of saint Sachinin in Toulouse, France, and from there possibly divided between that church and the Cathedral of Santiago. In his 1884 papal bull, Omnipotens Deus, Pope Leo XIII definitively asserted the authenticity of the relics. At least for Catholic believers, this seems to settle the issue. The Catholic faithful then receive confession before attending one of several pilgrims masses held each day. The highlight for many is the ritual swinging of the Botafumero, a silver censer created in 1851 and weighing 180 pounds. This 5 foot 2 inch high thurible is filled with charcoal and incense and swung across the transept by eight maroon robed officiants. Tradition holds that the Botafumero was originally used to fumigate the church, given that most pilgrims had not had the opportunity to bathe during their long journeys. For many of today's peregrinos, the ritual is a dramatic climax to their Camino journey. The ambulatory surrounding the main altar contains many chapels with masterpieces of sacred art. 
Among the most significant are the Chapel of St. John or Chapel of Mercy, with its central image of St. Salome, who according to Catholic tradition was the mother of St. James. This statue of St. James stands nearby. The 16th century Chapel of the Holy Cross has a magnificent terracotta altarpiece depicting the lamentation before the lifeless body of Christ. The 11th century Chapel of the Savior is the central chapel of the ambulatory and has as its main figure this Gothic image of Christ revealing his wounds. Medieval pilgrims came to this chapel to confess their sins in their native languages and received the Compostela granting them an indulgence. There are also images of St. James and the Black Madonna in this chapel. The cult of the Black Madonna is well established in Mediterranean Catholic countries. Shrines like this one are pilgrimage destinations in themselves throughout Spain, France, and Italy. Some pilgrims take the opportunity to walk along the roof of the cathedral from where they can view the cathedral's cloister, the Seminario Mayor, where Catholic priests are trained, a thousand-year-old convent, and a stately Baroque house that now features cafes, bars, and restaurants. Pilgrims can also get a close-up look at the famed Baroque clock tower, whose bells ring out every quarter hour. This carved image of Kronos, Father Time, is the tower's artistic highlight. For Catholic believers, it is now time to visit the Pilgrim's Reception Office, just behind the Parador de Santiago, where the Compostela is granted. Peregrinos have to show their Pilgrim's passports with their required stamps, and attest that they made the pilgrimage for spiritual reasons. It is vital that the passport has stamps documenting the last 100 kilometers of the journey. For many pilgrims, this is the end of their journey. But for a hearty few, the way beckons them to continue to Finisterre, 90 kilometers away on the coast of Galicia. Uh, once you are involved in the Camino, uh, you don't feel you are stepping the way, even with the six or seven kilos on your back. Uh, the Camino is taking you. But you have this feeling, really. The Camino is taking you. And I have heard many people, when they arrive in Santiago, you know, you need key more is to get Finisterre. It's the end's land, uh, where the shoes are burnt and so on. You put the new clothes because you are supposed to be a new person. Uh, and people go to Santiago after so much suffering, and they still want to go to Finisterre. Um, the appeal in Finisterre as well is that for some people, when you get to Santiago, you experience a lot of things. You're, you're coming to the end, your goal in a lot of ways, um, and then wondering what next. And I can imagine after being on the trail for so long that a little ache comes back. And you're like, all right, let's do this for a couple more days. And just falling back into that wild. There was, there was less of a, I mean, with the shops along the way, there's certainly a little tourism added in. Um, but in Santiago, it was pretty evident this, this place exists now, currently, for this economy of people coming to it. Um, granted, it's based on an incredibly spiritual and meaningful basis, but it's in your face. <laughs> and I think that would be enough to draw me further on the trail and get back to what initially that that reflection in a natural space and that sort of wild child thing um, and reconnect with my people in that way. It takes about three days to walk to the coast and the first place pilgrims stop is Muchia, a town known for its beaches and fishing industry. The town is part of the Costa de Morte or Coast of Death, a region known for its rocky shores and frequent shipwrecks. The town's name references the medieval Benedictine monks who established a monastery nearby. Also near the town is the Sanctuary of the Virgin of the Boats. The church was built over a pre-Christian Celtic shrine and used as a monastery until the 17th century when the present sanctuary was constructed. Historians claim that this part of the Iberian Peninsula was slow to convert to Christianity 
only becoming Christian in the 12th century. The church features this bell tower and gate for looking out to sea, and a beautiful altarpiece flanked by replicas of fishing boats. The sanctuary was a place where anxious relatives could pray for their family members who were out to sea. The rocky coastline provides a place where pilgrims can rest and contemplate what comes next. From Lucia, pilgrims make their way to their final destination, Finisterre, which means the ends of the earth. Crosses along the way memorialize seafarers who perished in the waters below. On the rocky coast that descends to the ocean, pilgrims engage in the final rite of the Camino, the burning of one's clothing and boots. In medieval times, pilgrims would burn all their clothing, symbolizing the death of the old self and the birth of a new identity. Gazing out into the Atlantic Ocean, peregrinos reflect on the spirit of the Camino, the flow of people, places, joys, and sorrows that has brought them to this still point. But along with the potential for inner transformation, the Camino is an experience of community that draws forth a powerful spirit of mutual service and universal human solidarity in the midst of life's struggles and challenges. Perhaps in the end, this is the Camino's most profound gift.